So first things first, Paul, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I mean, uh, um, it's nice to uh, see everything reopening at the moment and be able to go out without a mask. So Paris is starting to, to pick up nicely. How has the last year been for you creatively? Was it difficult? Uh, I think it, no, it was quite, it was quite a good opportunity for us to uh, actually have some, you know, forced conditions of being isolated from external inputs. So, I mean, for the creative process, as far as I'm concerned, it was good. Alex is more of an extrovert personality. So I think he was missing really more the contact with the public. But as far as I'm concerned, I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, being able to work in these conditions on this album. Okay. Well, before we jump into the album, I'd like to go back uh, and do a little bit of background uh, first. So, well, one thing I wondered, and uh, I believe you were both part of the, the Parisian music scene well before you started working together. Do you remember what you heard in Alex's music before you knew him? Uh, well, I remember he was... Uh just a very entertaining DJ, very engaging person. And uh, he was very, he's quite popular. He was more part of the original crew of Le Baron. So he, he was touring more with the team of Le Baron and so on. And in that sense, I was quite, you know, just amongst all the DJs at Le Baron, I thought he was probably one of the coolest, but I didn't know him very well. And yeah, I was, I was always very patient also. I never forced kind of a, a meeting with anyone and that's a kind of a lesson is way of, of doing that I adopted a while a while before. And um, yeah, I just I remember he had a great playlist and it was very colorful, very fun, very entertaining. And, and technically it was a very good DJ also. And in hindsight, do you know why kind of that type of uh, approach worked with your approach, with, with what you were doing? Uh, I mean, yeah, we're complimentary. Uh, Alex, as I said, is very really geared towards the public, towards entertainment. I was a little more introvert and also more trying to please maybe myself and my aesthetics. And he's really trying to play to the crowd. So we're complimentary in that way. He's also, yeah, he was very technical as a DJ and I, I learned a lot from him. And I was probably more of a producer. I'd already released a couple of records with other projects. And Alex was all, only like kind of doing uh, demos on, on Ableton, whereas I'd already like bought instruments and I had a recording studio and stuff. So we were complimentary on those two things. And obviously kind of music is, is very much, uh, it's, it's never finished. It's always, you're always searching for, for something new, I suppose. So uh, for you, what was that, especially in the beginning of, of the two of you working together, what were you looking for, so to say? Um, I was at a point where, I was doing a lot of collaborations and I was doing a lot of things without, I kind of, I was just going through the movements of doing collaborations, doing things without aim. And I, I did a lot of projects where I tried to release stuff and it didn't really work. And then I started, I did this record in Morocco where I wasn't trying to do anything. And I collaborated with the Moroccan and Gnawa musicians and it was probably the best record I'd ever done. And I, I, I realized it through the feedback of the public. And, and so I started just saying, okay, like stop trying to do the music, controlling it and just collaborate and open yourself. And uh, there was maybe too much ego, too much trying to like control everything. And um, so that's how I started inviting more people in the studio. And there was no idea of starting something specific with Alex, just the song we made, Revolta, interested all our friends. They wanted to play it. And then someone wanted to produce it and release it. So it just started naturally like that. Right. And then you released a couple of EPs. Uh, the first album came out in, I believe, 2017. Mm -hmm. um, were you surprised? Well, surprise might not be the right word, but what was it like that people kind of latched on that they, that, because it was received really well? And like you said, you, initially you were uh, kind of more focused on yourself and now your music is received really well. What was that like? Um, well, as soon as we released the first EP, I mean, that was 2013. And until the album, there was quite a few releases. And I think Dorothy in 2015 was already a, a next step. Mm -hmm. the, we felt people were really interested and like following what we were doing. And then we released Canope, Nana, the Canope EP before the album in 2016. And that also was generating interest. And we were, um, I mean, our, it was kind of linear. And uh, 
it was linear, but from the beginning, from 2013, it was under a good start. There was always mm. like good energy and we never had to worry about work or money again. Like we're always DJing, we're always like, and we were producing and we felt like, felt like we were on a path towards something that was, uh, yeah, kind of like, you know, something we really wanted to do, both of us. So, um, I mean, we were super happy that the album was, uh, did as well as it did. And it, once again, it didn't blow up right away. It's kind mm -hmm. of uh, the tracks picked up slowly and new territories discovered us. And um, so, yeah, we're just, we're very humbled by what happens and very like grateful and so on. And uh, we just we keep on doing what we're doing. Like we tried to do the same thing, the same method for the second album, try to keep on doing surprising music. And especially after having made the second album, how do you look uh, back at uh, Caravel now? Does, what kind of feeling does it give you? I mean, I, I love Caravel. I, I couldn't stand it when it came out anymore, okay. because, uh, as uh, happens often, like, you know, you hear the album too much and that's how I feel a bit with Sikorama. I'm, I have, I'm not listening to it anymore. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to give it like three, four months before I listen to it. And, um, but I mean, after a year, I, I, I think I thought it was, it was cool. It's got a great energy. It talks about traveling. It talks about po like positive things, a lot of good influences. And I think we did, uh, yeah, it was a good defining album for us to start our, our, our musical career. And we set something, we set the sail in a good direction with this album. So, and it's done great. It's interests the public all around the world like you know from from asia to the us to so on so it's um yeah we're very well, i just uh, very proud of it with that in mind then when kind of the process started on uh, cyclorama what where was the sale po uh, sale pointing towards were you looking for new directions uh i mean we what we did we didn't just start cyclorama and do it in a year we we were working during the three years we were touring And we were sitting on 30 demos uh, at the beginning of the confinement. And we just work, started working on all of them. And slowly but surely, we picked out the ones that were coming out. And the concept started rising also. We had this idea of the, the life cycle and like traveling through time instead of traveling to, through space. And, um, and uh, yeah, so it was, you know, we didn't, we started the album kind of as soon as we finished Caravel and we already have demos for the like more okay. new stuff. Um, right now I'm, I'm working on something right now as right before we were talking. So, okay. So, so it's a continue, it just keeps on going. Exactly. And so some demos are from nearly three years ago and sound more like Caravel and some are a bit different or there's some new influences also that, that came along, but um, it's a slow evolution process. And I think, we always like to link with uh, nostalgia and childhood and happy stuff. So there's still going to be some of the Caravel influence in all our work. Well, with that in mind then, because uh, the single Anakuni, uh, which is referred to as a, a children's song, but I've, I've never heard it. Maybe it's, it's specifically French, but it's also very uh, American in a way because it's, it's uh -huh. uh, Native American. So yes. how did that song come up in a way? Uh, well, you know what? It's it's famous. I mean, it's sung in, in French kindergartens and also mm -hmm. I think in American ones. It's become quite a popular song over the past three years. If you can you can go on uh, iTunes, you'll see there's like 40 recordings of this okay. song and a lot are for childhood nursery versions. And for us, it was a, uh, we knew a version that was uh, from the 70s that was popular when we were kids in the 80s in, in, uh, in France. And, um, and Alex's son, Kung, is started singing this song at the kindergarten and so we're like okay well this is this kind of makes sense and this is we just we like the song and we tried it on this demo and it, it clicked right away so we're like okay this is this works with the, the concept of the album as a childhood song for us and of course we also in parallel kind of discovered more about the song that it was a native american it was 14 or 100 years old it belongs to many different tribes with different meanings And it can be sung for happy occasions, like a beat, like the version we did, or it can also be sung like as a lamentation for more for uh, funerals and stuff like that. So it's uh, it's a complex song, but it's traveled through time because it's the words are powerful, and it stayed in our head because you know uh, it stick it sticks like a like a meme in your head, sure. and uh, that's why we wanted to do a version of it. And what I like in particular is that I've, I've been listening to, to this version of uh, 
the good, the bad, and the ugly soundtrack uh, by the Danish National Choir. And it, it does have that Ennio Morricone kind of feel to it. So was that deliberate? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, we had this this intro is very Ennio Morricone-esque, and that's another reference we like. We this this song, as usual, like our songs have a lot of parts, and uh, we're also in interested in uh, cinema music, mm. and we, you know, so so we did something a little bit uh, the wild the wild west kind of imaginary before to introduce this uh, Native American song. Right. And then I do want to mention uh, the video because uh, Naomi, uh, no, I forget the name, right? Naomi Terrace and Benjamin Moreau did the, the kind of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, visual side of it. So and you've been working with them uh, for a long time. So, so what, what makes that connection, that, that collaboration work so well? Oh, well, we, we met each other before Paul and Pan. We were all DJs at Le Bar. We were all DJing in this club. And uh, Noemi, Benjamin, and Alex started the project Radio together, Radio with Five O's, which is the musical time machine uh, app website. So they were already in, in business and working and like passionate about collecting music. And uh, yeah, they're amazing graphic artists. And uh, I guess from the, from the beginning, they just happened to, to be close to us and try something and it clicked from there. And do, they did all our sonography for the Caravel tour. And they're doing our, our vis the visual production, like the, the jackets for all the releases. So, so yeah, Noemi and Benjamin, like without them, it wouldn't be the same project. They're, mm. they're really part, they're the end of Polo and Pan. They're, they're hidden in the project everywhere. Fair enough. Uh, well, you mentioned kind of the cinematic qual uh, quality and uh, I, I would think Requiem is one of those as well. So mm -hmm. um, how does a song like that start from a productional standpoint? Do, does it just start, start with a certain mood or a sound? Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how we started Requiem because Requiem is a song that we started more accompanying the album. We're like, okay, we're going to do this life cycle album. So let's have a, let's have a Requiem. Let's have a and we use kind of the beat, the beat and bass from uh, our song Colombe that we really liked for the more electronic groove part. And the theme was rewritten. Alex actually rewrote the main theme towards the end. The song sounded quite different. And he had this like major minor kind of idea that really came together. And then, yeah, no, no, it's, it, 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 was, it was a long process. It was a long process. I'm trying to even remember what it sounded before. And it's... Uh, it's lost in, oh yeah, yeah, we started, of course, we started with the, we recorded an instrument called Crystal Bachette, which is a rare instrument created in the 1910s. And it, okay. it's a mix of, uh, it's a glass instrument, it's electrified and you, you put water in your hands and you pull on the glass, it makes it vibrate. It goes, Whoa. That's the intro. The intro is with okay. Crystal Bachette and we were experimenting with this instrument. And uh, yeah, there was there was many many demos and it changed it changed a lot. But I think it's uh, we got some help from an arranger also, uh, uh, Bertoli, who did like some some of the classical arrangements, some of the violins, and we rearranged over that. So yeah, it's a long process and it's it definitely something geared towards cinema. And I think will be interesting for the for the live show to put in sure. lights and so on. And for instance, you you mentioned the strings, and what I find interesting then. Uh, when do you decide, well, this needs strings and we need to get somebody to, to help us with, with the strings? Is, is that just, just uh, experimentation almost? Uh, yeah, we talked to our, we tried many collaborations around strings or we talked many times about maybe trying with an arranger because a lot of, you know, a lot of musicians that we love like Gainsbourg and so on, they work with arrangers and you can kind of upgrade it's, it's a way of upgrading for the second album, maybe getting some help for some classical arrangements on some of the album. And for sure, he wrote some stuff that we wouldn't be able to write, but then usually we would uh, take his stems and recut it and rewrite over that. Mm -hmm. Gave us other ideas to rewrite. So it's really a back and forth. And um, as soon as you hear something else, it inspires you to write something else. So it's really a mix of, uh, of, of his work, our work and going back and forth. And then is it then difficult to know, okay, now it's done, now, now we, we've done enough? Uh, yeah, that's, that's really hard. That's, it's never, never where you want it. And so we, you know, there's only so many songs. I can't imagine people doing movies, you know, like <laughs> this album, we, we work for a year and well, the demos are probably from three years. It's, you know, 
So I can't imagine how they managed to do a movie in, in one or two years when like an album is only 14 songs and there's so there's so much work and the mixing and everything. It's all very, it's a very long process. And yeah, yeah, it's hard. But I mean, I guess when I listen to Caravelle, I feel I feel like, okay, it's finished. Except Kyrgyz for me, which wasn't really finished. But um, so uh, with the hindsight, it, I, I think it'll probably be feel like feel like it's finished. But like you said, you might need that separation now, just a couple of months of not, not being too focused on it and kind of listening to it with fresh ears. Exactly, exactly. I was, I'm too de detail, uh, focused on the details and like mm. some, some precise frustrations and so on. So exactly, you need to take a little time off and, and listen with fresh ears. With that in mind then, because the record is coming out Friday, uh, is that always an anxious period then for you? Are you, are you always uh, worrying about stuff? Uh, well, not really. I'm not very anxious. I never was, but I mean, I would say also the singles have been doing great. Mm -hmm. Everything looks like there's a good reception. So, I mean, if, if, if it wasn't, I would probably be more anxious and worrying about our future as a band. But um, I feel like it's been streaming really well. We get getting some really good comments, and uh, in general, where the whole team is excited, uh, the the label and the whole team around us. So I think things are coming together for an exciting second chapter of our of our musical project. And well, with, with you mentioned it already, but kind of the world is slowly opening up now, and then the possibility of live shows seem. Uh, at least halfway decent uh, again. So have you already th thought about kind of translating some of those songs and how you would do them live? Uh, no, I think we created quite a challenge for ourselves. Like we didn't, we didn't take the experience from the first album to the, the tour to make an, ease, an album easier to render our life. This is going to be hard. And that's a problem we're going to think about in September. Right now we're just going to do some DJ sets. We're releasing, we're doing a lot of the promotion and still, still writing music and so on. But uh, from September to probably November, we're really going to be creating the, the new live show. And the first thing is to create kind of a, like a mixtape, a track list and write a new story and mix in some of the old songs, some unreleased material and some of the new album, pick the songs from the new album, design the sets for like one hour, for one hour and a half. There's a lot of choices and then like, okay, what are we going to play in these songs that we chose? And that's going to be tricky for sure. Right. Finally, I want to talk about uh, one of my favorites on the album, which is Magic, which is, I suppose, based on uh, the pilot song from 1975, uh -huh. I believe. Um, yes. What, what was the inspiration? Well, was it just that song that inspired uh, Magic? No, it's funny because, there, well, there's two samples in the song and the other, the chords is uh just an edit that i would love to play it's from um it's an edit that's released on uh, the label uh I, i'm a cliche from cosmo Vittili, and it's the edit number 10 by young marco and these i would you, i would play this at the end of like dance parties because it's super it's super chill and it had right. kind of this pachanga boys uh time feel and I wanted to edit it to make it a little more upbeat. And then I was watching the movie Happy Gilmore with uh, Adam Sandler, where he plays a hockey professional that starts golf. Anyway, it's a funny movie from the 90s, but this song is, the soundtrack is amazing on this movie. I love it. And I was watching a couple of times and I suddenly like, I clicked on this song and I had the idea of like joining those two samples. I worked on the edit for a bit and then we ended up playing it at uh, Cerf, at uh, Chateau de Chambord, two years ago. And something happened, like everybody loved it and the label, everybody noticed it. And so we decided, okay, this is not going to be just an edit. Uh, we're, let's try to work it together and make it more pull and pen. And, you know, in the beginning, it was just like sort of just a loop, but it really kept caught together, caught an emotion. And um, yeah, we, were, we worked this out. Obviously, yeah, it's uh, it's a more sample based song. So, but I guess it's part of the DJ culture. Also, French touch, you know, like a good a good sample can create if it can create a big emotion. It's always it's always good. Yeah, like you said, it really sets the mood. It's it's really atmospheric as well. So, uh, yeah, that's one of my favorites on the record. Um, yeah, it's, it's my dreams to play it at, at Burning Man. That's the <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, finally, then. Uh, yeah, well, I was going to ask kind of uh, how, what would you like um, or how would you, if people don't know uh, Paula and Pam, how would you kind of uh, 
like them to be introduced to you but i don't know if that's a good question but do, do, you, yeah. do you have a um well, okay, let me, uh, let me ask it differently, because one thing I really like about uh, the music that you make is it's, it's very upbeat and positive uh, and atmospheric, like I said, but it's uh, without becoming corny or without becoming uh, yeah, a yeah. bit silly or something. So, so, so is that something you consciously think of? Yeah, yeah, it's a fine line. It's hard to make, uh, I think it's challenging to make positive music that also has a quality of being deep and being right. re really touching. And that's kind of a conscious choice we made, although we do have some like darker songs and we're more sun and moon on the second album, so a little more balanced. But uh, making a song with major chords or like just a smiley energy that is not cheesy is a, is a challenge. And um, yeah, I guess it's something we, we didn't set out to do it on purpose, but uh, it's just something we started doing from the beginning and even on Dorothy, Dorothy is a happy song, but it's got a bit of a psychedelic environment and you know, some ideas like that. So we're always trying to surf a fine line and not go too far in one direction. Feel Good is really, you know, it's nearly cheesy and the, the lyrics and the energy, like the chorus. But um, we're trying to surf that line, writing something that's uh, positive, bring some positivity in the world also that probably needs uh, to uh, uh, celebrate some, you know, like, happy things and not only the darkness darkness is very inspiring for artists like you, when you're hurt and you're mm -hmm. suffering you can write some beautiful stuff but that's just not what we happen to be doing right and like uh, like i say i do think you walk that line very well uh, paul thank you so much thank for you. taking the time to talk with me hey thank you thank you man um a pleasure robin hey yes <laughs>